Well, kia ora tato. Um, welcome. Uh, ko Tauperi Te Maunga, uh, ko Waikato Te Awa, ko Tainui Te Waka, ko Matt Toku Ingoa, he piko, he tanifa, he piko, he tanifa. Uh, welcome. Uh, I'm Matt Boswick. I'm Partner Director at Microsoft New Zealand, and it's my absolute pleasure uh, to introduce this power panel, uh, and this really is the power panel for today, folks. Let me uh, share that with you. Um, this is a panel of <coughs> folks who are going to discuss how creative industries and innovation can drive uh, economic well-being for our communities uh, into the future. So first, let's uh, meet the panelists. I'm going to start at the end there with uh, Imcha Furi. Uh, she's the CEO at Outset Ventures. Uh, it's the largest and fastest growing hub for deep technology startups in Aotearoa. Uh, Outset offers investment, commercial lab and workshop facilities and incubation programs uh, for early stage ventures founded on science uh, and engineering breakthroughs. Uh, some of the innovative deep tech companies that are part of the Outset Ventures Fano uh, include HeartLab, a cloud-based cardiology uh, imaging platform, and Asterix Astronautics, which creates power systems for small satellites. So that's uh, MG. Coming this way, uh, I'd like to introduce uh, Maru Neho Neho, uh, Maru no Nati Pro, Te Fanui A Apanui, Me Naitahu. Uh, Maru is the founder and managing director of uh, Metia Interactive, an award winning game design and development studio. Uh, Metia Interactive creates games that are educational, uh, interactive, uh, and designed to address social challenges. Uh, and cultural narratives. Um, the studio has also created games for platforms including Nintendo, PlayStation, and my personal favourite, Xbox. Uh, Mari was awarded the New Zealand Order of Merit for services to the gaming industry and uh, to mental health, and she's on the board of Māori Television. Alicia Staples uh, is the co-founder of Click Studios, uh, a co-working space for creative tech entrepreneurs. She's the CEO also of Staples VR. Uh, she sits on the board of TVNZ, uh, Toy Mai, the Workforce Development Council, uh, focusing on the reform of New Zealand's vocational education system uh, and on the strong public media establishment board, working on the merger of TVNZ and RNZ. Uh, and next to me here is Joel Little, uh, Joel is a music producer, a musician, and a Grammy award-winning songwriter. Uh, he's worked with artists including Lord uh, Taylor Swift, uh, Broods, but you'll all remember him as the lead singer of Goodnight Nurse. We've talked a lot about that uh, backstage, the panel, uh, remembering some of the, the fun gigs we've all been to. Now, along with co-founder Gemma Little, Joel is setting up um, Big Fan in Morningside. Big Fan is a space for people to create, to write, to record, to produce, uh, and perform uh, in high-end recording studios. Uh, and also, it'll be a live music venue all under one roof. So, let's just quickly set the scene. We've heard about the Koi 2 report, and now Scenario 2 uh, suggests that Auckland could be a city of creativity, culture, and innovation. Each of these panellists uh, here represents cutting-edge ventures uh, in creativity and, in uh, Imcha's case, deep tech and innovation. Uh, I'm just in awe of the, the passion and the stories of each of these panellists. They're young, they're incredibly entrepreneurial, they're globally recognised in their fields, and they're really putting Aotearoa and Tamaki Makoto on the map. Um, Auckland represents half of New Zealand's creative industries GDP. So it makes sense that creative industries can drive uh, our economic uh, recovery and growth. Uh, Auckland is a UNESCO city of music. We're New Zealand's screen production capital. We have a thriving game industry, although we're going to talk a little bit about some of the, the issues that uh, the industry is facing. Um, we also have world-leading universities that are supporting and driving our science-based ventures. So let's hear from these panelists. My first uh, question, and I'm sure if you don't mind, I'll start with you. Why do you think Auckland can be uh, a creative capital? Is it our people, our place, our connections? What is it that makes Auckland a place for creative industries? And I'd love you to share some of your mm. experiences and thoughts. Uh, I think we need to just be careful not to fall into the trap in thinking that um, Auckland becoming a creative hub is inevitable. It is something that's going to have to be intentional and deliberate, and we're going to have to work at it. Um, Auckland, I think, is quite unique because we have 
a reasonably high amount of freedom in our careers. Um, I have to say not all Aucklanders experience this freedom, uh, but by freedom I mean the ability to switch careers, the ability to ask for flexibility in your employment, to pursue other interests, um, to be able to take risks without there being uh, huge economic risks to yourself. Um, and so that freedom allows us to have really broad, varied skill sets and careers, which I think is super special. Um, we're far less likely to pigeonhole ourselves and each other in a particular niche, and that's your career for the rest of your life. Um, and I see this all the time at Outset. Uh, we have, for example, one of our entrepreneurs um, stepped out of his career in the Air Force to come to Outset to build a technology that would help his father who has mobility issues. Um, another went from academic research to a career in patent law for bioenergy companies and is now starting his own biotechnology company in this sort of resource renewal space. So I think that having quite a bit of freedom to have generalist and broad careers is important because it allows us to then bring things together in a really unique way because you bring a little bit of that, a little bit of this, and put it together in a new way. Thank you. I love that that comment there about don't assume this is going to happen. I think that's really important. That's kind of what we're here for today, I guess, is to imagine what that could be. Maru, if I could come to you and ask the same question, why do you think Auckland can yeah. be a creative capital for Aotearoa? Well, uh, first of all, we are the Pacific capital of the world, basically. Mm. So we have a high population of uh, Māori and Pacific, um, which, of course, means that we have a pretty high degree of um, diversity and authenticity, especially when it comes to storytelling and um, not just representing Auckland, but New Zealand as well. Um, we have a high uh, young population as well, which is really important because they make up our future workforce. So I guess to enable the kind of city that I would like to see, which is a highly um, Māori Pacific inspired, not just visually looking city, but actually in terms of creative technologies, then we need to um, make sure that the next generation that we want to work in these creative, creative industries are being embraced to be able to bring that creative, technologically advanced Auckland to life. Um, I think that it is our um, value you know, it is the value of this country, it's the value of Auckland as well. Um, but there needs to be, you know, quite a lot done to ensure that we're able to bring our young uh, people, our rangatahi, into um, the mix of what a creative technological future will look like. And, you know, it's not just about um, bringing in our toy or our creative um, know-how and our authentic stories, but they also will build the fabric of who we are, you know, as Aucklanders as well. And um, to have that integrated not just into business or into our creative or gaming industries, but into our community as well, um, would be, I suppose, something that feels real or is real and is authentic and told with that authentic voice. Um, yeah, and I think one of the challenges for us is how how do we build this creative, Pacific, you know, diverse um, industry here in Auckland? You know, how do we support our young people, our next generation? Because at the moment, it's pretty challenging. You know, there, are, there is a lot of opportunity. A lot of people are working on this. And we need to be able to bring, come together to bring that, I guess, vision to life. Yeah. Kia ora, Mari. Alicia, I'll come to you. Same question. Why do you think Auckland could be a creative capital? I have an interesting response. I think that it used, I used to think that it could, and I think the pendulum is starting to swing the other way. Um, so I'm looking at a screen that says creative industries driving out um, recovery. Um, but from my point of view and, and the point of view of people I've spoken to over the last couple of weeks to look at how I would answer this question, um, we feel a lot like we are fighting to be heard and that we are undervalued when we are look, looking at, from a government structure. Um, during COVID, just it, it kind of rapidly made this um, come to the forefront. So I would say that 
when Staples VR started and we looked at where we were going to be um, headquartered, we picked Auckland for a variety of different reasons. And if we were to make that decision right now, I'd find it more difficult to choose Auckland. I find that we are fighting um, every day to be heard at government. I find that we're now fighting to decide whether we go to Australia. And that's because the Australian government is a lot quicker to uh, see that during COVID, the creative sector boomed. People hired people. They didn't make people redundant. Um, and in New Zealand, we're struggling to find staff here. So our issue at the moment is, um, for the first time ever, we are going to outsource overseas because we can't find the talent locally. Um, so it's a bit of a negative comment, but it's actually the right time because the pendulum is swinging and I don't think it's gone too far to correct it. Um, but I think if we're going to talk about things like our creative industries are driving um, our recovery and, and, and what we've done during COVID and, and what we could do into the future and that report showing what New Zealand, what Auckland could be like, the key word, um, as you mentioned before, is could. It is an option. Uh, we need to select that option and get behind it and, and make sure that the smaller companies that are starting here aren't having to fight the battle just to be heard. I love that. We need to select that option, get the drop-down box and click click on the option. So um, thank you, Joel. I'll ask you the same question again. I mean, you're, you're someone who's experienced uh, a lot of the world, been, been around and worked in different places. Um, you know, what in your mind, uh, or why in your mind could Auckland be that creative capital that we all want to select? Uh, well, first of all, I agree with Alicia. I think there are a lot of challenges there. Um, but on a positive note, um, I do think we have the talent here, first of all. Um, in all of my travels, you know, I've written songs all over the world with you know, people from all sorts of different countries, and I know for a fact that our skill level here is the same as what it is over there. There's just uh, there's a lack of opportunity for people to kind of get into those rooms and have a go at that level. And when people do get to that level, they tend to have to go overseas to be able to further that further their career at that point. Um, one thing that we do have here that I think is great that I love about New Zealand is if I, I work a lot in LA and I love riding there with people but I also love leaving LA because it's a very particular type of place <laughs> and to be able to come back here and I just feel like we have a unique viewpoint here, you know, we're separated from the rest of the world, we look at things a little differently and I feel like that's one of our strengths. I think that means that we are creative in a certain way that is unique and that works and with what artists are looking for overseas. Um, yeah, but one of the challenges is definitely uh, people think that we're miles and miles away. So when I'm talking to people in LA, they'll say, and I'll say that I've just flown over from New Zealand, they're like, oh my God, like, how are you feeling? <laughs> I, they don't even, they have, kind of have no idea where it is. And I'm like, oh, it's actually like an overnight flight and the time difference isn't that bad. It's, you know, between three and five hours and it's closer than Australia. And they all go, it's closer than Australia. You know, like they don't, they actually have no idea. And so when I tell them about what we're doing and what we um, have down here, you know, I feel like as soon as we start getting some of those people down to experience New Zealand and write down here and create down here and get and be separated from those more intense uh, places like LA or London or whatever, I think they'll love it and they'll want to come back. Thank you. We've talked about some of the, the opportunities, but also I guess some of the challenges, some of the headwinds. Um, so maybe let's kind of dig into those challenges a little bit and think about what are some of the things that would help us overcome those. Um, and maybe, Alicia, I'll just come back to you because you, you kind of dug in on this a bit. What, what is it that um, your organisation, and let's you know, talk about um, Staples VR as a, um, uh, as a VR production studio, but also Click Studios as a, as a place. What is it that your organisations need to thrive? Um, so we need connectivity to the rest of the world. Um, we also need the ability to um, get together and collaborate. So Click Studios is a co-working space that we designed that allowed um, creative technologists to get together and share each other's resources. So instead of all investing in the, in the latest hardware, computers, headsets, that you could actually leverage each other and invest in paying your own bills, or like paying yourself and hiring people, um, as opposed to, to hardware investment. So that's one, like a, a, um, a, a collective... Um, space where people can grow and um, Auckland Limited's been very good at that, like there was an AR VR garage that really launched Staples VR and being able to do what it could do and Click Studios was really our gift back um, because at that point when we launched that space there wasn't anything that was 
providing that leverage. So um, that's some things. But the other things are just really simple. They seem really simple when I say them out loud. But in Australia, there's a 40% rebate on salaries. So we instantly can't compete. And so we're looking at a 40% hike in salaries to stop our staff being poached over to Australia. And the u unique position that we're in is that we have an Australian office, so we need to lift the salaries over there uh, to compete locally with Australia. And then we've got a New Zealand team that we need to do that with as well because of the equity, equity between the two. Um, and then I think there's something that we've that Maru kind of touched on, but we haven't hammered down on enough, which is the Māori and Pacifica participation in this sector um, and ensuring that we are focusing on that. They are our best storytellers, and I think this is our best platform. And so we need to make sure we're doing. We have a focus on also bringing that through as well. I want to just pick up on that point. <coughs> excuse me, that you you made just here about storytelling, and Maru, maybe you know, come to you on this. Creative ventures help tell our unique stories, and and that can sell Auckland and, and Aotearoa to the world. Um, what's been your experience mm. of that? How have you? taken creative storytelling and turn that into, you know, a driver of economic outcomes? Well, it is a process. I mean, to tell an authentic story, it comes from the heart of the people that tell it, which is usually iwi or, or hapu. So we work closely with iwi to be able to translate their story in, onto the digital platform. And that's great locally. You know, we can and we do work with um, different iwi across um, the whole of Aotearoa and um, bring their stories to life. The challenge really though is, especially in the gaming industry, is talent, you know, especially senior talent, which as Alicia just pointed out, we are going to lose, or actually it's very hard to find them because of the different incentives and tax rebates um, currently in Australia. Um, so it was hard before, it's actually much harder now um, and as a really good example of that, we're building a, a game which is relatively huge um, for our small studio. Um, and the goal early on was that our studio would build the game, you know, because it would be a New Zealand-made game, it's a Māori game, it's made by a Māori company, and all of that. However, um, my option at the moment looks like I will probably have to outsource that game. And that wasn't the kaupapa. You know, that wasn't the point or the vision for the development of um, one of our larger games. Um, but currently at the moment, you know, especially in the Māori community, um, we have such a low number of Māori working in tech. Um, so then that trickles down. I mean, I could talk about this for ages, but I won't. <laughs> but it really starts with education so and coming through. So our biggest challenge is really um, finding talent and then having that talent in our studio to be able to train the next generation of developers. So, yeah, outsourcing looks talent, like the option. Talent came up on the, um, on the Slido questions as someone said, you know, what, what's, the, um, what's the answer to the, to the talent, talent issue? And I have to say my um, day job at Microsoft working with Microsoft partners, the, the number one issue I hear all the time is, is talent and how that's holding back um, tech businesses in New Zealand. But what is the answer to that, Maru? Just, you know, from, from your perspective, you, you talked about having to start right back at the beginning with education and, and how we mm. support that. What, what are some of the ways you're looking at it? It is, I mean, um, Alicia and I talked before yep. um, the okay. panel and it, and it really is about, you know, we have a lot of juniors coming out of um, educational institutions at the moment. Um, and yes, we do give them work to do, but it's bringing them up to the next level. You know, um, I would class myself as a senior developer, um, but I cannot, you know, just me, train everybody, you know, that I need to be, to bring up to speed to, to be able to work in, um, you know, the gaming industry. It's very, very hard. So I think the, one option could be, you know, because there are many, would be, um, you know, going back into schools and, um, you know, thinking or putting together a system where these kids can become interested in tech or creative tech, um, in my case, um, to, you know, get them moving on into that industry because a lot of the resources that are there right now to be able to learn about game development are free. You know, just, it just takes time to get on 
um, and, and learn how to actually put things together. Um, but it's a bit deeper than that because then teachers need to be aware of how to teach this and all that. So where we can become involved as an in industry is collaborating mm. with the educational sector, putting in some systems and processes in place that will allow these juniors um, or rangatahi to come through to work with us in our studios, but that means that we need to be supported to be able to deliver that type of education as well. You yeah. talked, I'm just going to um, jump on this point here and I'll come back to you, Alicia, but you talked about this point around collaboration and I think, Imcha, I wonder, I wonder if this is a good segue into us talking about the importance of place, mm. you know, and place-based initiatives. So yeah. Outset Ventures, you know, is a physical space, right? When you're talking about collaboration and bringing people through, how important is that place-based initiative in, in that? This is at the heart of what Outset is. It's, it's bringing people together who are on similar journeys in terms of building a tech-based startup. They're all facing similar issues. How do I think about IP? How do I think about ESOP? All these sorts of things. And so being able to bring people together who are at various stages of development means that they can learn and borrow from one another. Um, speaking to, uh, to what Alicia and Joel are doing, it's also the fact that we can then invest in um, equipment and hardware that everyone in the community can access without them having to make those investments, that's huge as well. Um, and having a piece of uh, equipment, whether it's a thermal chamber or a vibration table, just downstairs is super helpful, as opposed to having to go through university and having to jump through their bureaucratic hoops to try and access the same equipment. Um, it's just pop downstairs, do what you need to do. Um, and so having, there's also su such beauty uh, at outset in having different industries in the same building. Um, we've got industrial chemistry next to aerospace, next to biotechnology, which means that if you've got a problem in your chemistry company that you need a sort of a biochemist perspective on, you can just go down the corridor and borrow one for a few hours because that talent lives in the building. Um, and so this, this, this place part of what we're doing is so important. I'm going to come to you, Alicia, in a second because we, I want to talk about the difference between physical space and virtual communities. So let's pick that up. But Joel, you're building a place, right? Someone mm -hmm. asked in the question, what is Big Fan Studio? So maybe you could answer that for us. And then again, think about or, or talk about, you know, what is the importance of place, physical space, interaction, when we're thinking about creating some of this collaboration? Sure. Well, um, <clears throat> so Big Fan is a, uh, is a not-for-profit um, that my wife and I have set up. Um, there's three recording studios upstairs and a 200-capacity all-ages venue downstairs. Um, and we, we did it because there's, a, there's a, a real lack of those types of facilities in New Zealand. Everything in there is high-end, so it's all in all the studios, it's all gear that I use day-to-day -to, -day to make successful international songs with. Um, and I just wanted it to be a space where people at all levels could come in. You could bring in, you could have people that are already at the top of the game go in there and be very happy with everything that's in there. It's all as good as it can get. And then you have young people who can come through and have an accelerated ride to, you know, to, to be able to take it to the next level because they aren't working with bad gear. They're working in really nice sounding rooms and a really beautiful space with really great stuff and so I feel like that's just going to help people kind of jump a few steps ahead and encourage that and um, we just wanted to create a space that A, will help people who are ready to go to the next level, go to the next level, but also we want to be able to kind of plant that seed with people. So I have this dream of somebody coming in, writing their first song in the studios upstairs and then playing their first gig in the venue downstairs, you know, and then they gain experience that way, they go off and start their careers and then they come back and mentor the next group that are coming through. So there's a whole, um, the community aspect is hugely important and I feel like in sounds like with all of these industries having that, having people that you can learn from and turn to and ask advice rather than, you know, now you can get recording gear and record stuff in your bedroom um, and it can sound great, but you're still on your own and it can be kind of a lonely existence trying to figure it all out. So if, you can, if there's a place you can go, talk to people, find people that are like-minded, you can just skip a lot, of the, a lot of the heartache that can come with trying to figure it all out. 
there's something pretty awesome too about um, having people, as you say, they're at the top of their game, and you've worked with some, you know, international superstars. Let's be, you know, let's be honest. Mm -hmm. um, would you see a scenario where you could attract some of those international artists to come to Auckland to work? and kind of feed into that, that local creative scene. Yeah, completely. And I mean, I'm having those conversations now and talking with labels over there and publishing companies over there, and we want to make it a destination for those mm. um, companies. We want it to be a place where, um, I mean, a thing that happens a lot in the music industry is writing camps where you get a bunch of artists and a bunch of writers and a bunch of producers all in the same place, and they kind of, you, you make different combinations of people each day in each room and everyone just writes songs and it's like uh, there's something really communal and creative about it and everybody pushes each other and this place is going to be perfect for that type of thing. Um, and then I see in that we are, we're able to feed local artists and producers and writers who are ready to get to the, you know, to take it to that level. We're able to put them into those sessions with those people. They have an opportunity to upskill that way, to make connections that way and then that can be a path to furthering their careers. So. Lots of lots and lots of opportunity there. So, Alicia, um, similar question for you. Click Studios is is a physical space, right? When we were talking earlier, you said you thought about potentially starting a, a virtual community, but you came around to this idea that the physical space was really, really important. Can you talk to us a little bit about how you got to that point and, and then what is it about that physical space that's really important for what you're doing? Yeah, it, it comes back to that, what I think we've all kind of been talking on the same theme about collaboration. Um, so we thought, well, yeah, we could get a virtual community together and we can um, all kind of help each other. And if there's a problem that's been solved, if you put it out in our virtual world and someone has already solved it, then we can lead it that way. It didn't solve the problem about hardware. So, um, for example, Staples VR needs a studio and an audio booth and an edit suite and all the stuff that we don't use all the time. We use it like one or two days a month. And so there's no point in having it inside of our office when no one else can access it. So we put it into this communal space and we just became a tenant of that building so we could book it and use it the same way anyone else could. And that just logically made sense. And, and there wasn't really any way we could get that collaboration or access to hardware um, without creating a, a, f a physical space that people could have um, access to. Um, and there's a clock here that feels like we've got eight minutes to like make the biggest point we can to make everyone select creative as that <laughs> option. Um, but just to kind of um, just give a, an example of collaboration is how we've been um, scaling to date. So if you look at the stats, we're growing incredibly fast and we've done incredibly well during COVID. But to take a quote from a, a game studio owner, and I won't name who it was, but it's, I, I believe it as well, um, we're at a point in time that our struggle with talent and the struggle that we've been looking at how we in infiltrate kind of high schools and educate, um, we're at a point where we almost might start for the first time having to cannibalise each other because we've never had to poach from each other. We've never had to look at it that way. Um, but that was really pointy to me and made me feel like we need to go hard now because that pendulum is swinging. Um, I think that we've proven ourselves. <laughs> we can only collaborate so far. Um, we really need to be considered um, an industry worth backing. So given... The fact that we're now at seven minutes, let's, let's finish up with each of us sharing perhaps the two or three things that have to happen over the next little while for us to be able to select the option of Auckland being a creative capital. And maybe, Imcha, if I can start with you, let's get really specific. What, mm. what, what are the actions, what are the things that need to happen from mm. your perspective? Well, I'll simplify things because there's really only one thing that I think is most important. Um, you were asking earlier about what it takes for organizations like ours to thrive, and by no means is Outset a standalone organization. We only exist within an ecosystem that also includes universities and professional services and excellent migrant talent and um, a bunch of other stuff. And so for us to thrive, two things need to be true. We need to be super well connected to the other players in our ecosystem, and the other players in that ecosystem need to thrive in their own right. I think that we're all invested in ensuring that we all thrive, um, but the thing that's preventing us as Auckland um, is the collaboration piece. There is such, I don't know if it's hesitancy or risk aversion, but there is such a, such a hesitancy for large organizations in New Zealand to collaborate with startups. Um, it's this, this idea that the only innovations that are worth paying attention to are innovations that have arisen from the inside, um, whereas 
having a startup come in with a new technology or new way of doing things and incorporating that into the way you do things is incredibly powerful. And for that startup, it's a huge leg up. We are actually at the point now where we are losing startups out of New Zealand because it's easier to collaborate with corporates in the States than it is to collaborate with corporates in Auckland. The, the, Come on. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's Thank my you. point. Yeah. I love it. That is such a good point. Maru, we'll come to you on that. What are the two or three things that must happen? Um, well, without picking on other creative industries um, that are well supported by government, um, unfortunately, the game industry, um, although little things have been happening in recent years, um, we do need you know, support for this industry. I mean, it is huge on the global market. I mean, there are plenty of stats out there to say how gaming is good for education, is good for revenue, is good for a lot of things. Um, but unfortunately, our industry is not um, well supported currently at the moment, although things are getting better. If we were supported, I wouldn't be worried about talent or retaining it or finding it. Um, I wouldn't be thinking that I may have to outsource a major game of ours or even consider having a Meteor Interactive Sydney branch um, or, or whatever. Um, because they are things at the top of my mind, especially at this time when we're gaining traction in our business and things are going to have to expand. So I think more support. I mean, everything that everyone else has said before in terms of collaboration and education is really important. Um, we can grow homegrown talent, but what's the point if we can't keep them here? Um, we need to be able to be supported so we can support and then in turn grow our industry and a very creative um, Auckland in New Zealand. Um, yeah, I think that that's probably a couple of the major things that I like to bring up at this moment. And just on a small note, you know, looking at Auckland itself as a city, you know, with a high population and a young Māori population as well, um, you know, it, we need to actually have a creative city. So not just look creative, but actually be creative, you know, in itself, because the inspiration for you wanting to tell a story or for you wanting to make a game or a movie or a film is you're inspired by something. So why not be inspired by your home? You know, why not be inspired by Auckland, by New Zealand? Um, so I think of Au Auckland, I mean, I've been living in the Freemans Bay Ponsonby area for, I don't know, 30 odd years now. Um, and I've seen Ponsonby change so much. You know, K Road is changing so much. It's like the diverse look, the kind of creative spaces are sort of disappearing. And I think that's sort of some of that little bit and bits and pieces that we need, you know, because it's, um, it's visual and it's, it can grow people's um, interest in love being that. creative. Thank so. you. I love it. Um, Alicia. Don't hold back, this is the chance. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, we need to stop getting phone calls from other countries that have come from New Zealand, gone overseas and come back because they've assumed we can't do it here. That happens to me all the time. So an example, um, Warner Brothers in New Zealand needed a specific camera. It was quite new tech, so the assumption was it wasn't here. They rang LA and said the only person that has that is down the road from you in Auckland. So we were there within 30 minutes of getting that phone call, but it was very close to flying in an ent entire other um, company to come and do that job. Um, we need uh, uh, the government to um, take some of the burden of training. If we didn't have to pay for the training and pay for the international awareness ourselves, we would be able to invest in our employees um, and we would be able to grow a lot faster, I think. Um, so a, a big financial burden from us is actually funding this ourselves. And what about, last thing, um, what about that, um, that that issue around pay uh, between Australia and New Zealand, is that something that needs to be fixed? Well, Australia c clearly chose the option and is doubling down on it, and we haven't chosen the option yet. All right, Joel, lucky last. What are the two or three things that you know need to happen? Uh, for us, the, the thing that's been the most painful about the whole process has been uh, all the red tape. So I, don't, I don't know if... Um, if I've had too many things more so, uh, soul destroying than applying for building consents. Um, <laughs> it's been, 
been an absolute nightmare. And I mean, right now we're going to be, end of next week, we'll be pretty much 100% done with all, like the building will be fully complete, everything's in there ready to go. Then we have to, for, for various red tape reasons, have to apply for our um, code of compliance, which we've been told will take up to six weeks. That six weeks that the place could be being used to make a difference. People could be in there working, being creative. We'll just be sitting there with this beautiful building ready to go. And we've had, I mean, months of delays of various amendments and things and waiting, and it's just, yeah, it's been painful. So, I mean, I would love to see some sort of situation where there was more help in that regard, especially for things deemed worthwhile in whatever way that are going to help the community and help grow the creative industries. I'd love to see something happen where they just make that easier or easier for us to work through as well, to just stop wasting so much time. It's painful. You're somebody who likes to get on with things, I can tell that, Joel. It's awesome. Well, listen, um, we're at the end of the panel. Thank you all so much. Um, some really good points, some really clear actions, I think, but also some, some real opportunity for, for Auckland and some decisions for us all to make about whether or not we really do want to select this option. But thank you all. Really appreciate it. Ka kite. Thank you.